Welcome to Marketing Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. Here's your host, Stacey Jones. Welcome to Marketing Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. I'm Stacey Jones. I'm so happy to be here today with you and I want to give a very warm welcome to Allison Mace. Allison is the Managing Director at Apollo Partners, a full-service independent media agency located in San Francisco. With a 15-year career spanning agencies, including Starcom, Maxis, Horizon, OMD, and Essence, Allison knows more than a thing or two about media strategy and client service and branded content. While helping to lead media for the Pepsi account at OMD, she and her team brought to life the Mountain Dew League, the brand's first sponsored esports game tournament in partnership with the European Super League. Allison is also a vocal advocate for female mentorship and support within the media and tech industries. Today, Allison and I are going to be chatting about all things media and strategies to help clients grow their businesses successfully. We'll learn what works from Allison's perspective, what should be avoided, and how some brands just miss the mark. Allison, welcome. So happy to have you here today. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much, Stacey. Well, you and I were chatting a moment ago, and you have a long and storied career at working at some very large agencies. And I'd love for you to share how you got to here today, where now you're at an independent, after going through all of that work. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, Great place to start. So when I was a child, my dad actually had a creative agency that he ran out of uh, Manhattan. And so I was always kind of exposed to the advertising industry as a whole, much more obviously from the creative side of it. Um, I did not (laughs) inherit my father's creativity and I am terrible with design in terms of like, don't trust me with Photoshop. (laughs) Uh, But I always was interested in advertising. And to be honest, I took like one of the very first media planning courses at my, um, at my college that they offered. It was kind of like a trial class and sure. Lots of people saw the description and they were like media math. And I was like, sign me up. (laughs) That's so interesting. Um, and from there, there was just this like connection that I found really exciting. You could understand how a consumer ticks and like what makes them decide one brand over the other, you know, what the things are that, they value. And then you could actually match that and match it also with what they're doing in their daily lives. So you can actually, you know, reach them, which is really the core of everything that we do within this industry. Um, And so from there, you know, I went back to New York first thing and I started working at Maxis, which was a small offshoot, but within Group M. So we had, you know, the the large scale of um, that agency behind us, which was incredible. I kind of got like a nice little balance of being able to be in an entrepreneurial kind of team, but also have like such support and backing from the larger agency as a whole. Um, I kind of, I would say cut my teeth, so to speak, within the P within um, the CPG world, which foundationally is a great place to start because they have a lot of rigor and process. Um, You know, they're really core on their reach and frequencies and things like that, which is a great place to learn. You know, some people say you kind of learn your or earn your MBA working on a brand like PNG, which, you know, I've, I've done that as well. And working on the PNG business, I participated in the launch of ZQL, which at the time didn't exist, you know, and now we've got like a huge sleep aid market that um, is now huge. But from there, I, um, you know, worked across different um, pillars of the business, different client sets, Um, Most recently, I was working on the Pepsi business for a long time out of OMD, and then I worked on uh, the Google business, um, and I ran one of the larger teams within uh, the Essence team there. And yeah, it was a big transition for me to go from a, a large agency background, a large team that I was managing, the Essence team that I managed, um, you know, indirectly, I managed probably about 75 people, which you know, is huge. And then to move to a small quote unquote, like startup media agency was, was a big change. But I think, you know, again, kind of tying it back to my father and the fact that he owned his own company, you know, decades ago, it was exciting to be able to see the impact of was doing more readily. You know, I can make a decision now at Apollo about, you know, are we going to participate in the business pitch or not? Um, and I can really see the impact of 
what I'm delivering for the client and how satisfied and how happy they are. You can see the direct impact of the media that you're placing and things like that. So it's definitely been a bit of a change from like a, a size perspective, but it's been an exciting change and I am really excited by new challenges. Well, as the uh, founder and owner of a small agency where we have, you know, we turned up to 30 people or so at a time, it's a big difference from a giant company, but it offers some really unique, cool things. I mean, there's benefits on both sides of it, but you get to do so much more and you're so much more instrumental in the impact that you make on clients and team members when you're working in a small organization for a large one. So I'm hoping you're, you're going to enjoy this and it's going to be <laughs> like, a, wow, I get what my dad was doing. I love this world of more entrepreneurialism. Yeah, so far it's been really fulfilling. I've been here with the team since September. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I'm kind of coming up on that year mark. And when I speak to the founder, Eric Perko, you know, I tell him like, I don't ever think back and, and think, you know, oh, this was a tough decision. I actually think, why didn't I do this sooner? Because I enjoy it so much more. I think, you know, just like what you were saying is, you know, you can make more of an impact on the teams and things like that. But I think the clients feel it too when they're serviced at a level where they have hundreds of people or tens of people that touch their business, it can feel really easy to feel actually the opposite that, you know, there's almost no one to talk to who exactly is taking care of my campaigns and who exactly is keeping an eye on everything like that. So I think the clients feel that in a different way too, which is partially why we're, we're trying to stay small so that we can drive that impact with the clients too. Well, you end up not having as many resources to be able to pull from, right? Whether it's people resources, software resources, because I mean, large scale media agencies subscribe to a lot of stuff. And even as a small agency, you can subscribe to hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of stuff, but you're not typically subscribing to the millions of dollars worth of stuff. But it's not necessarily needed either. You yeah. have plenty of companies and brands who do extremely well um, with that more handheld approach of a smaller agency who's a little more nimble for them also. And I think it depends a lot on a brand's life stage. You know, if you're not a Procter & Gamble, you're not a Pepsi, you know, you're someone who's a, a little smaller than that, which is most companies out there. Um, it is nice actually knowing your team members and kind of having more of a uh, knowledge of how you're impacting their agency and how their agency is impacting you too. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think there's been a bit of a misnomer in the industry for a while that you can only get serviced or only get some of the bells and whistles you kind of just mentioned from the larger scale agencies. And I think over since the pandemic, really, I think it kind of reset that in terms of you can still get the same service. And quite frankly, we have access to all the tools that we need that the large scale agencies pay for and you get better service and we have the ability to make the same kind of partnership recommendations that the large scale agencies do you know it used to be oh you have to be with the clout of a x holding company in order to have a super bowl spot that's yeah. not the case right like you need the connection and as long as you can have and make that connection we can do it for you and arguably sometimes better because it's a more one-to-one -one relationship. And so sometimes that gets caught up in the larger scale agencies. Especially if the company you're working with is a little more entre entrepreneurial also in its nature and self. Um, I think that's where it can really help. And you see, you know, it just thrive with people working with people. Yes, absolutely. And that's what this business is at the end of the day is it's your team, it's your clients, it's your relationships. First and foremost, I always say, because you know, my background really has been client service and client leadership. It goes down to how your relationship is and it needs to have a strong foundation because it is people at, at the end of the day. So with people, if you are going to shed some light on working with clients and, and how is it different for you? Like when you're starting to work with a client now, you know, what is the difference of an approach from an independent versus a large scale agency? How are you um, coming to the table and changing your approach? Yeah, I think my philosophy has really always been, and sometimes this has got over well with some of the larger agencies and not as well, because there's a mentality of yes, and 
uh, you know, how can we pro- problem solve and do where I actually think it's beneficial to be because it's so relationship driven, this business, it's really important to be honest. And sometimes to be honest, you have to say, no, you can provide an alternative solution. Absolutely. But in order for a client to really trust you, they need to know that you're going to give them pushback. Maybe they want to go into a partnership or, you know, have a partner on the plan that really doesn't make sense for them. We need to be able to rely back onto that trust building relationship and say, I don't recommend this, or this isn't what's right for your business. And I think that's really what is, is more able to happen at a smaller agency, because that's really what's more embraced, I would say. Well, and in that way, a smaller agency is looking at more of a partnership with the brand versus being a vendor yeah, who is fulfilling. Absolutely. And that's really what it comes down to is, is that partnership piece. What else do you do? Is there anything else on, that's different in their approach? Um, I think, you know, another thing that's really important is to treat every client's business like, you know, like it's your own. But I think that, you know, that's like an, an old adage you could say, but it's really true. It's it's being proactive. And, you know, I think one of the things I've I've enjoyed about this, the shift that I've made is there's a lot more room for kind of like future thinking and headspace versus just getting buried in the sand of like, this is the immediate problem that I have to deal with. And so it's really about what's next on the horizon. You know, I think, um, you know, things like how can we integrate like AI into what we're doing and how is the client going to be at the forefront of the next technology? What about the future without cookies? And, you know, those larger, bigger problems that are going to be coming down for the clients versus just the immediate, you know, CPM focus or something like that. And so with your team, how is it different working with a smaller team or does it feel the same, even though it's not five people to manage now? (laughs) No, it's great. What we've done and had huge success on, because we're also spread out, which I think is a lot more of the norm now um, in the post kind of like COVID world, which I really appreciate. I think that you know, being able to have flexibility to work from home or we have WeWork locations. And so, you know, like today I'm I'm in the WeWork, but I have that flexibility. Um, one of the things that I think we're really able to do is make quick decisions and, you know, really like action against that stuff. I hope, you'll, you know, we can really make decisions on the fly and do them quickly with just a core set. Whereas, you know, before sometimes it was, you know, decision by committee to some degree. And, you know, particularly in my role as managing director, I have the ability to, you know, let's make that executive decision. Let's, let's move on. I was on a meeting this morning and, you know, there was debate on, should we do it this way or should we do it that way? And I said, guys, let's do it this way. You know, we didn't have to kind of like ask all of the people or run it up the ladder, so to speak. So, um, and I feel like clients also recognize that. And when it comes down to, you know, hours and efficiency, there are so many different scales of efficiency that I feel like are, are impacted in a positive way. When you have a small team, you know, you're nimble and you can move quickly and it's, you're not turning the cruise ship around. (laughs) And the only, the, the flip side of that is that you are nimble and you're not turning the cruise ship around, but it's working with clients who are not trying to get you to turn the cruise ship in circles and making sure that you are not going off on tangents just because you can create quick decisions. Because I have had many clients over the years with that, where they see how nimble we are. And so they think that you can go down a path and then you can just change and you can change and it can change. And then all you end up doing is burning time and dollars, obviously, in making all of those changes. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, I've definitely experienced that as well. Um, and it can be, sometimes it's kind of exciting because you're like, Oh, you know, another, another change and like, let's explore this other option. But you're right. Sometimes it's hard to kind of take a little bit of a step back. And what I always like to ask as well is it's not really about the question that you're asking. Why are you asking that question? And if we can understand that with our clients, we can usually take it a step above to, actually fulfill what they're trying to get. You know, sure, they're trying to get maybe a number or something to share with leadership, but 
the why behind it is really what is crucial and to some degree can help with some of the run around, not always, but. <laughs> so when you're working with your team and you're working with a new client and you've decided that, yes, you've, you've green lighted that RFP that you've just mentioned, you're all sales ahead, you want, you want it. How do you start working with the client? How do you make sure that they're happy in their approach working with you? Yeah, I think it's about um, setting expectations from the forefront. You know, what we do is we have a pretty robust, even though we're a quote unquote small agency, we have a lot of really good process in place. A lot of the team that I work with has come from, you know, the biggest agencies in the world. A lot of us have run the biggest brands in the world, like the Googles and, you know, uh, the cachet of that. And so we have a lot of process in place in terms of, you know, this is sort of the onboarding. Like these are the things that we're going to need so that we can understand and get under the hood on your business. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's really important to put in those, those checkpoints at the beginning it, albeit doesn't feel like super organic to sometimes hop on a one-on-one -on -one or whatnot, but you really need to develop that relationship from the onset and also try to make it more than just about the business. You know, you really do need to try to see if you can peel the onion back a little bit is what I always like to try to say. Um, and then you have, you know, things like regular checkpoints and follow-ups to, you know, if we just did, for example, on a client, we had a big recommendation last week, you know, it's about following up with them, you know, just me separately, you know, we had this presentation, you know, what were your thoughts? We'd love feedback, positive or negative. Right. And I think, and I think even to that point, welcoming sometimes call it negative feedback is actually really important because that's, that's how you learn. And that's how ultimately you can improve the deliverables that we have for the clients or whatnot. I think, again, back to my kind of like no philosophy, um, it's not scary to get negative feedback because it helps you change and it helps you grow as a team, as a company and as a partnership, really. Well, it also just helps with communication because that's the biggest issue. I think a lot of times with clients and agencies where everyone is thinking they're rowing in the right direction together and there's just little bumps that can happen along the way. And if you allow the negative constructive feedback to come in, it kind of pops a balloon a little bit with the client instead of allowing perceived resentments to start adding up and adding yes. up for any little tiny slight that one team member happens to do, including how they might sign their email, whatever it might be, that's to the point of ridiculousness, or maybe there's just something that's missing, or maybe there is something about the culture of the brand that the agency just doesn't know, and they yep. haven't been onboarded about. And because they haven't worked with them for the last decade, they don't know about these little ticks that they need to know. So that feedback is so vital in order to keep a long-term relationship going and also to allow the client to understand that they can say they're unhappy about something. They don't have to pretend that everything is like awesome and fantastic and wonderful when they actually are bugged by a little something. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think it's also important to maintain touch points across all of the agency partners that clients work on. You know, I think from a media perspective, so we're, you know, a, a traditional full service media agency, but it's really important that we have really strong relationships with our creative teams, whether it be, you know, the full service creative or social creative or whatnot, because of that same thing, you know, it's, I've many times in my career, particularly like in the earlier days, you'd have the creative team going off on one complete, you know, mental path. And then the media plan comes due and it's like, well, we don't even have TV and you guys created a TV spot. <laughs> So it's also really about making sure everyone's kind of on board with those regular touch points. Um, and, you know, on like a tactical level, the recommendation that I just mentioned we presented last week, we had met multiple times with the clients to say, this is how we're interpreting your brief. This is the kind of like bones of what we're putting together on the outline. And does this make sense with you? We met multiple times with the creative agency, even though the plan wasn't approved here's what we're thinking about that's going to be on the creative deliverable that that's on your team. But, you know, we wanted to make sure we're all in sync on that stuff. So to your point, you know, there aren't any kind of um, perceptions along the way that people are, are taking away that not everyone else is. 
And I think you just said something that is super valuable that's a little bit different in, from what we we're talking about, but really we should hone in and dive into it a little bit more. You just said that you're involved in RFP. So a request for a proposal for anyone who doesn't know what an RFP is. And you asked questions and then you can continue to ask questions, which is the absolute inverse how a lot of agencies work. And, and brand managers out there who are listening into this, you know, please know that you all can get a better RFP and a better response if you actually set up Q&As, you actually engage with the agencies or the vendors that are talking to you, because otherwise it's such a siloed world that you're not actually giving the agency the benefit of a true discovery about who your brand is and a deep enough dive into what the goals and objectives typically are. And that black and white on the paper does not translate always into the proposal you're expecting at the end of the day. Yeah, a hundred percent. And even, even when you do have a call with say like a client, you know, they're briefing you on the next campaign is let's just say back to school or something. Even if they walk you through that brief, when you sit on it and marinate on it, it, there are different questions. And then when you put it back into the terms of what your agency does, you know, in my, my experience, I'm, you know, on the media side, but like what I interpret from a broad brief is going to be different than what a creative agency interprets. And oftentimes what we, what we do that we see success with is exactly to your point. It's, it's a, this is our kind of like regurgitation of the brief. This is our interpretation of what you've asked us to do. Does this ladder back to what you're actually asking or or not? And then, yes, like here's the outstanding list of questions that we have because of it. So, yeah, it can definitely sometimes feel like a an uncomfortable thing to your point to kind of like go back to a client or a vendor or whomever it may be and say, I have questions. but ultimately that's how you get better, better work across the board, in my opinion. Yeah. And it should actually be a red flag for any agency who is working on an RFP with a brand who's refusing to answer your questions. It's a waste of your time. Very likely they already have someone else who's up for that RFP. They're just putting you through because procurement requires it or an upper management. Someone said, oh, we should have more bids that come in on this. And they already know who they want because that's why they're not giving you that time of day. Right. And I think the, the, vice versa is true too. If a agency isn't asking questions, that's also a red flag to me. You know, are they not invested or have they not spent the time on the project or something like that? But questions are important. <laughs> they are. And it's interesting, just RFPs in general. I mean, I know a lot of agencies who are refusing to do in, in general RFPs, unless they get the 101 sit down time, unless they get to, you know, that's part of their own um, consideration of working with a brand because brands can have a habit sometimes of spitting out a lot of proposal requests to a lot of companies. Um, and I even have a mentor who says that you should not respond unless they let you know who else is in on that pitch. I have yet to really actually meet anyone who lets me know who is actually truly all of the people who are on on the pitch, but it's an interesting question to ask. Do they give you the number? That's what we've had success with is, can you tell us how many other agencies are participating? Yes. And usually, usually we'll get that. Um, yeah. It's funny that you said that Eric and I had an experience in the fall of last year where we were told that we were number 15 in an RFP and that's a lot. And, you know, he was like, I have this rule. I have a number, you know, I kind of want to back out at this point. And I was like, let's stay the course. Let's do it. And uh, the great thing is we won the client. You won it. Look at day. that. You're like, I told you so. <laughs> it's true. Like we've done the same thing. We've gotten through RFPs and we've found out, you know, like looking at who is bidding on it. And they're not even our peers. They're not even who we consider our, our competition. And we've ended up winning the business before. And so it's interesting how brands sometimes can just send out something and they really are not sure what they want, but they figure it out based on how you respond. Yeah. And it's interesting to hear who someone thinks that, you know, your competitive set is, right? 100%. So one of the other topics that I had very briefly mentioned in your bio is your 
very outspoken and very strongly held beliefs in supporting women in the agency world. And obviously I can say how you got to have these beliefs and feelings is because you are a woman. I, 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 you know, <laughs> we can say that, but what is it that you see is happening right now for younger women in this space? I am proud to say that the industry is changing. I will couch that with the fact that, you know, do I think it's changing enough? No. Is it changing as dramatically as I would like it to? Also, no. But I do see some change, which is overall positive, I would say. You know, I entered the, you know, large scale media ag agency world 15 plus years ago. And there were lots of women in the lower or like mid tier rungs of the leadership ladder, but everyone up above was, was heavily male and, you know, very homogeneous, let's say. Um, and I have seen a lot of success in, in seeing some of that change. You know, I do think it's still a long road, um, but I think it's really important that we as women see one another in those places and support one another in those places. You know, I, I'm not where I am today without the women who made it possible for me, who supported me, who mentored me and who really, you know, advocated for me and, you know, how I try to think about trying to pay it back is really supporting those, whether they be underneath me that I am, you know, senior to making sure that I'm mentoring them in the right ways um, but also just supporting those around me. I think there's still a really long way to go in this industry when it comes to diversity, um, inclusion and, uh, you know, equity. There's a really long way to go. I personally have a mixed race daughter and I want to see more of that in the leadership within this industry. And I think we just need to force the change. We need it to happen because that's also tying back to our, cultural identity in the United States too. You know, we need to represent what we are. Well, I think that, you know, for one, 50% of consumers are women. And so if you actually have women on your agency teams and in higher executive positions, they are going to better be able to communicate to that 50% of people who think a little bit more along the lines that they do. A hundred, a hundred percent. Right. I mean, and that's, that's another reason to diversity is also so key, okay. but yes, I mean, women are so instrumental when it comes to the buying power that we have, the influence that we have in the marketplace. And, you know, again, I think there have been strides that have been made in, in how advertisers communicate to women, but um, it's important to have us at the table to be participating in those conversations. Um, I recently heard anecdotally that there were a bunch of finance companies that got together a couple months ago to talk about work from home, go back to work or go back to work, go back to the office. And there was one female at the table, you know, and half of their workforce is female. How, how is it not represented at the table when they're making core decisions like that? It's not. And, you know, even I was just in New York for some of the upfronts. And when you walk into any of those network upfronts, typically you're seeing white men in their 50s, 60s in the leadership roles that all the tables are hobnobbing around. And you see younger women, but it's typically more in support roles um, and not in strong leadership roles. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And I think we just really need to challenge that status quo. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think as a woman, we're also, you know, we're asked different questions in those in those kind of conversations. I was recently um, at a business meeting and someone made a couple comments about my my age and tying it to like my my leadership status and. It, Okay, I'm going to interrupt real fast. So for our listeners, like I have no idea how old Allison is because she looks a lot younger, I think, than she actually is. But she could oh, also you. she could be, you know, older than I like. Who knows? But she's not someone that looks old. She's not someone who looks young. She looks like she's kind of in the center of her career and rising. Obviously, we know she has a daughter, so she's not 22 years old. Um, she could be, but she's not. You know, so keep on going. <laughs> Back, just back to that point, you know, that's not a an age related comment is just 
not something I, I think men often get yep. in the industry. And it kind of ties back to the, um, you know, how, uh, you know, we sometimes doubt our ourselves as women. And I think, you know, we really need to not do that because we are incredible in the workforce. <laughs> I think women can multitask better. Again, this is just from having managed hundreds of people over my own career. <laughs> but I think in general, I value the men in our agency a lot. Absolutely. And typically are, and, and men have a different way of looking at things. It's really interesting putting us all at the same table because there are different thoughts that come out of different people. And whether it's age, whether it's sex, whether it is race, all of those that diversity actually really does result in one thing being looked at in so many ways differently, yes. which is phenomenal. And I don't know if you're not in that setting, if you don't actually see that at work, if you understand what you're missing, if you don't have that. Yeah, a hundred percent. I've always really advocated for the fact that there's more ways to the right answer than one. You know, you are going to take a different approach than I will to get to maybe the same exact net thing, if that's the right answer. But everybody's perspective is going to drive a better result at the end, at the end of that conversation. And if we're not sat at that table to help influence, it's going to be very homogeneous. And yeah. that's, that's not what it should be. So Allison, how can our listeners find out more about y'all? Um, so you can find us on Apollo Partners. Um, we are very active on our LinkedIn. We look forward to engaging with some of you there. Perfect. And Allison, thank you so much for joining today. Really appreciate your thoughts on the land of the media landscape for independent agencies versus large agencies, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and the importance, and especially with mentoring women in business. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Stacey. This was really fun. And to all of our listeners, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Marketing Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. I look forward to chatting with you this next week. And until then, if you have any questions ever about how you can leverage your brand in content, movies and TV shows, product placement, music videos, all of those cool things that get chatter through social media and press, reach out, give Hollywood Branded a call, and we'll set up a call, uh, time to speak with our team. Have a great one.